Welcome once again to Ngubani Movement. Today we are doing the eighth lecture and we are so excited to be welcoming all of you wherever you are streaming live and wherever this lecture is reaching you. We are excited once again to bring thought-provoking lecture uh, that deals with the issues of our continent uh, as Africa. And we are so excited again for the support that we are receiving uh, from all our friends, from all the people who are streaming live, and uh, the inputs, the contribution that they are doing to engage us. And thank you so much. Please invite other people and friends to continue to follow and subscribe uh, and follow us on YouTube. Uh, our handle is Ungubani. And on Facebook, we are Ungubani Movement. And then on Instagram, we are Ungubani underscore movement. We would really love to hear you talking to us. And today, once again, I would love to introduce our uh, beloved speaker, um, who is the founder of Atlas L Group, a wisdom counselor to all mankind. He's a businessman. He's a brand strategy curator and author an Ungubani 360-degree human identity coach. His mission is to inspire individuals to become balanced, impactful leaders who are good stewards of talents, of time, of money, of self-actualization, and everyday life. Ladies and gentlemen, Umngobi W. Kanyembe Kantombela, the label that speaks. As Uzuide has said, let me take this time to welcome you on our eighth lecture. <clears throat> We've titled this lecture, Cry Africa, My Beloved Continent. Cry Africa, My Beloved Continent. First, let me tell you what this lecture is not about. This lecture is not about us blaming the world over what has happened to Africa, but acknowledging that we know that we are here because we started somewhere as a continent. This lecture is not some continental uprising where we are taking arms as Africa against Europe or other continents. This lecture is not some economic revolution positioning type of an agenda or narrative. None of that. This lecture is a consciousness lecture. It is about our collective identity as Africa and as Africans. It's an inward-looking type of criticism when we say, cry Africa, my beloved continent. This is us saying charity should indeed begin at home. So that as Africans, we realize for us to solve our problems, we must acknowledge our role and the role of, of those who've brought us to this reality. It was Ali Mazurui who said, you are not a country, Africa, you are a concept. You are not a concept, Africa. You are a glimpse of the infinite. It's amazing that to be called a, glyph, a glimpse of the infinite means there is endless possibilities about our continent. We are endowed with the greatest natural resources in the world over. When you look at our continent, we are the youngest continent compared to other continents in the world. But are we realizing our potential? But are we living up to the true potential that we have as a continent? Can we first acknowledge that Africa Other continents are puffing and passing on Africa. I call man Africa. In fact, there are people who sat back then to smoke Africa. And in Africa, in 1880 up to 1914, who are the people that are responsible for having sat around the table to dissect Africa into parts? I think let's call them out. Most of you would know them. Britain. Or the, great, or the Great Britain Empire, is among those 
that are responsible for having sat around the table to claim or petition Africa. Belgium, among those. France, among those. Germany, Portugal, Holland, Italy. These are countries, and to some degree, other continents, that looked into Africa back in the years and said, something is happening there that could benefit us. These are the people that have been smoking Africa from 1880. I'm happy to report, though, that though it's been centuries of being smoked by other continents, I pale Africa. And I also pale Africa. So you and I, as Africans, must realize that instead of blaming the rest of the world for what has befallen us, we can actually be participants and be responsible for taking our continent forward. The Berlin Conference of November 1884 to February 1885 and the events that followed had the effects of not just giving Africa its present borders, it also attempted to integrate Africa into the European concept of nation states with clearly defined and demarcated borders. The scramble for Africa by Imperial Europe and to that effect, the beginning of the rudimentary aspects of nation state, by bo uh, nation state borders in Africa had began before the conference. The Berlin Conference only served to regulate the imperial process of claiming ter territory. It was naturally followed by even more competitiveness amongst the European powers, because more than ever before, the concept of effective op occupation had been added to the game. In this context, the borders imposed on Africa were conceived to be exclusive, meant to separate one sovereignty from another, and supposed to be mirror reflections of the European nation states' borders with their characteristic dual role of peace and war, as famously observed by Lord Carson, who said frontiers are indeed the razor's edge on which hung suspended the modern issues of war and peace of life or death to nations. So when you look at how we were dissected as Africa, those became the frontiers on which hung suspended our modern issues. All the wars we've ever fought as Africa were hung suspended on those frontiers. And any peace that we have as Africa, any bilateral that we have as Africa, all hangs as part of those frontiers. Whether we are dying as a nation and as a continent, or we would see life as a continent, all hung suspended on the frontiers of the very things that would have see, been seen as dividing us as the continent. On the occasion of signing the Anglo-French Convention on the Nigeria-Niger boundary in 1906, Lord Salisbury, the then Prime Minister of Britain, was credited to have remarked, we, the British and the French, have been engaged in drawing lines upon maps where no man's foot ever trod. We've been giving away mountains and rivers and lakes to each other, only hindered by the small impediments that we never knew exactly where the mountains and rivers and lakes were. Regarding Nigeria's eastern border with Cameroon, a British colonial officer recorded the method used in delimiting the borders. He says, in those days, we just took a blue pencil and a ruler, and we put it down on an old caliber and drew that blue line to Yola. I recollect thinking when I was sitting, having an audience with the emir of Adamawa, surrounded by his tribe, that it was a very good thing that he did not know that I, with the blue pencil, had drawn a line through his territory. A caliber and a blue pencil and a ruler is what was used. Imagine, here is the map of the world. In the Berlin Conference, it means what they were doing is they took a ruler and put it in the map of the world. And by drawing a blue line, they were determining territory. If a blue line went over you drawn by German, it meant you belong to Germany. If a blue line went over your territory drawn by Britain, it meant you, be you belong to British. 
while our forefathers were enjoying their lives here in Africa, worshipping their shrines and their gods or demigods, whatever it is, enjoying meat and music, there was a group of people sitting, drawing lines over a ruler on their map, claiming territory. Naturally, the result of this exercise, common all over, all, of, all over Africa, was division of peoples, bifurcated political and social systems, and fractured cultural areas, which eventually led to further dislocations and disorientations, particularly amongst the border populations. On this, Aswaji 1984 has confirmed that borders were drawn across well-established lines of communication. In others, people who were able to communicate before lines were drawn so that it separates, because then if you were my neighbor and you could communicate, but all of a sudden the, the ruler had been drawn so that your neighbor belongs to France and the other belongs to Germany, all of a sudden, therefore, you were colonies and you were no longer friends. The sense of community in terms of the traditional concerning ancestry was also divided. Sometimes the very kinship that you had, which was strong in Africa, was also divided. Our shared social political institutions and economic resources were divided. Our com common customs and practices were divided. And sometimes we had to accept, or Africa had to accept, a common political control. In other words, you had to be subjects of whoever was colonizing you. In many instances, when you look at the boundaries that separated the communities, sometimes it, co it separated communities of worshippers from their places of worships from their sacred groves and shrines. In other instances, which is well exemplified by the Somalis, the water resources in a predominantly nomadic culture um, was separated so that one state you have the, 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 the cattle and another state you have the pastures. Think about it. This is how we were dissected. The borders were thus arrived at largely without reference at all to the social, political, or cultural characteristics of the people they petitioned. According to Posner 2006, he says, a clear indication of their arbitrariness. According to Posner 2006, he says there is a clear indication of the arbitrariness of the borders in the fact that 44% of African boundaries either follow meridians or parallels, and, they are not, and another 30% follow other um, rectilinear or curved lines. So Africa, as it was being drawn, no one was even following the geographics, the flow of the rivers, the flow of the cultures, the geographies and the geopolitics all went out of the window. Further indication of the disrespect to the people they petitioned come from Asuwaju's 1985 estimate that the 104 international borders existing in Africa by 1984 and 1985 have dissected 177 culture areas or groups. The artificiality and arbitrariness of African borders are also the products and reflections of the rivalries between the imperial powers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In addition to these rivalries were the obsessions to exclusively claim certain real or imagined African resources. More often, the imperial powers were interested in one resource or the other. The control of commerce and markets, or access to trade routes and river transport systems, the colonial states and the borders that emerged out of these rivalries largely depended on how one imperial power outsmarted its rival. The borders around the Lake Chad, for instance, were drawn to reflect the rivalries between and the intrigues of the three dominant imperial interests the Germans, the French, the British. In this case, the interest of the Borno and Mandara sultanates and their people evidently did not matter at all. Similarly, the border between Nigeria and Benin reflects the interest and rivalries of the British and the French, especially over the control of the Niger band area near Nike, the ancient capital of the Borhu kingdom. The Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda borders in part reflect the, the British obsession with controlling the source of the Nile and the colonial intrigues to gain access to the mineral wealth in the eastern parts 
of the present day DRC or Democratic Republic of Congo. The overriding principle was the enhancement of imperial interests, disregarding totally the interest of the peoples of Africa. On the few occasions when the interest of the colonial powers aligned with those of the colonized people, such as in the area of the maintenance of peace and security, deliberate efforts were made to maintain pre-colonial political entities and or cultural areas. But in most cases, it was the interest of the colonizing country that dominated. When you look at Africa, for instance, then, back then, it would have meant when you look at the colonized possessions by 1930 and Africa, which had now become a colonized possession. So in other words, Africa moved from being a continent of possibilities with people who were dwellers there, it had become a possession. It was something that someone owned, the same way you own a jacket, someone owned a piece of Africa. The same way you own a spoon in your drawer, someone owned a piece of Africa. So when you look then from the southern Africa, right at the tip of southern Africa, in, from Cape Town all the way to Egypt, you would see that the British had their own ownership. If you were to put a color then, it means the whole of the southern Africa going all the way to the eastern of Africa, all the way up to Egypt, Britain had that. France on the other side took some parts of the western Africa. And when you look at Italian, some at the top in Libya, Italy owned that. The Portuguese took places like Angola as theirs. <laughs> it's amazing because at the time, those who were ministers or owners or monarchs in those countries subsequently were now owning us as Africa. Do you now understand why I say cry Africa, my beloved continent? You wake up one day, you are roaming your streets or your rivers or you are canoeing on your river and without the knowledge someone has arrived, a colonizing officer arrives and he greets you. And he comes and he meets a king in the local. And when he's in the local and he meets the king, they are welcomed with the dance and they're given food, they're excited. Africans are excited to see this Caucasian joining them. But what they were not aware is that they were bringing in those who were now owners of them, who had colonized them. The other sad thing about Africa, by the way, which I think has been unfair, and I think it's unfair with us as humans, is that People didn't see us as people. They saw us and continued to see us according to what they benefit from us. Think about it. Someone looks at Africa. You and I are here in Africa with our hopes and ambitions and dreams. Someone looks at South Africa, for instance. They don't look at us as people. They look at aluminum. <laughs> they look at gold. I mean, think about it. You look at Africa, someone looks at food. They look at cocoa, they look at coffee, they look at tea that they can get from us. Someone looks at Africa and they look at oil, crude oil, and all the kinds of oils they can get from Africa. They look at iron ore, they look at cotton, I mean, they look at textile. It's no longer about Africa as being respected as a geography, but Africa as a point of benefit. Cry Africa my beloved continent. I think we need to say as Africans to the European world, enough is enough. We're not saying do not come after our resources, but we're saying don't see us as only our resources. Do not come after our resources and see us as foolish so that we cannot even add value to our own resource but depend on you. The European countries must realize we too are people, we too are capable, we too have ambitions, and we too must benefit from the very resources that we've been endowed with. It doesn't help to be seen as poor, but have all your resources taken over by somebody else. If Africa is poor, why are we exporting so much? We are exporting so much because the value of our own resources is benefit to other people. And that is good in the economics and trade, but if it's, it's bad if it's done under the pretense and we are then rendered as nothing but poor. 
i Africa isabhenywa namanje kusaqhutshekwa namanje kusabhenywa i Africa buzo siyazi bazokutshena who is currently smoking Africa right now some are saying China is the new colonial empire and colonizer of Africa China by the way by 2013 already had signed agreements to the tune of 200 billion billion US dollars in trade that they had signed. Some of those included oil, minerals, metals, but also we know that by 2020, China had already pledged something to the tune of 100 billion rands in investments to help us with our infrastructure, to build our roads, to build our hospitals, to build our schools. When you look at the exports, Africa's exports to China, some of the leading things we are giving China, at 70% we are giving China oil. At 15% we are giving China raw materials. And there is other things we give them as well. Some of the leading of those that are giving China these things are Angola at 34%, South Africa at a whooping 20%. We have DRC at about 8%. These are South African countries that are giving so much to China. Yes, China is giving certain things to us as Africa as well. The China's exports to Africa, some of the leading things that they're giving is machinery at 39%. They're giving us manufactured goods at about 30%. They're giving us chemicals to the tune of 6%. There is more that they're taking and more that they're giving. Some are saying China is the new colonizer of Africa. I'm saying Africans and African states and African leaders, you must realize this. If China is allowed to walk into our Africa and not be engaged economically so that it's a win-win, then we must wake up and realize we are doing something wrong. When you're a political leader in an African country, you must realize your responsibility is not only to us as your citizens or to us as the states or statesmen or neighbors of Africa. Your citizenship and your responsibility is more towards the future of your own country. I think it's high time politicians realize that when we are voted into power, it's not just about benefiting yourself and gaining riches for yourself. That is too lame because you are becoming rich at the expense of the continent. We're actually saying when you become an entrepreneur, it's high time that you are realizing Part of starting a business is to fight poverty, but part of starting a business is to help Africa thrive so that we own our narrative. Africa must shift its narrative. We must shift our story. Here are the five Ungubani big Africa, Africa claims that we want to give to you and share with you, and hopefully they will help us move forward. Claim number one, we are saying the greatest African tragedy was the day natives became worshippers in their own kingdoms, slaves in their own fields, visitors in their own lands, and subjects even where there was no conquest. The day trust was returned with trickery. So the first thing we must realize is that we are dealing with an Africa that those who own it today and those who benefit from it today did it from a point of disservice to Africa. It was from a point of greed so that they take more from Africa than they are giving to Africa. So how then do you return trickery when you were a trusting continent? I think you go back and engage those who've tricked you and say to them, now I've realized that you tricked me on gold and my gold in South Africa has lost its value. Now something else is gaining value into Africa. Let's realize then that to deal with trickery is to engage fairly and frankly and say, we too are realizing our own value now, and we don't need others to value us. The Umbani big claim number two, it's not true that Africa does not value her women or that other continents value theirs more. It's not true that Africa does not value her, her education or that other continents value theirs more. It's not true that Africa does not value her development or that other continents value theirs more. It's not true that Africa does not value her innovation or that others value or other continent value theirs more. The problem here is not that it's not true, all these things I'm saying. 
The problem here is the narrative. The problem is Africa is not in charge of its narrative. Our media houses are working like they are borrowed from Europe. Can we have media houses and journalists who are going to be fair and balanced in their reporting? I'm not saying we must hide corruption, but I'm saying let's be fair and balanced. Before you write an article about a leader or a country or a section of Africa, can you go there first and verify if it's true or you're just purporting what you've heard from different propagandas that you received? Because sometimes what goes in perpetuity and that goes viral is the negative news than the good news. I'm telling you even right now on this Umubani movement we are running, it's very hard to make the numbers because what we are speaking is true and what we are speaking is deliber deliberate. But if we could take our, our, our tops off and start dancing and showing our muscles, that thing will go viral. It tells me that something is still wrong about Africa and Africa must wake up to its narrative. South Africa, it's not true that what is being played in certain channels on our televisions purported as our content is true. That's really not true. We are not a sum total of the issues of fatherlessness in our communities, as if it's only unique to South Africa. We are not a sum total of people that struggle with alcohol, as if that's the only thing that affects Africa. But if a lens or a focus is zoomed on that area more and media reports one-sidedly, then we are losing our narrative. I have a feeling that if you have a voice, you must be accountable with your voice. Because if you can influence as many people, then you must realize you need to influence them positively. The third claim that we want to give you, it must only be Africans who think everything of others and nothing of themselves. Think about it. We think so little of ourselves. In fact, we think nothing of ourselves in most cases. Some people say because we are poor, but I don't believe that is true. It doesn't mean that because someone is poor, therefore they're inferior. That's not the same thing. But it may mean that our low self-esteem has rendered us into the dogs of this world. I'm sorry to use the language. Africans are everything to the world. Africa is everything to the world. It's not true that we are nothing to the world. We are everything to the world. If Africa were to be wiped out and we didn't exist, who will give the world Ubuntu? If Africa were to be wiped out and not exist, who would give Africa the talents that we keep giving to America and Africa and, and, the, and the rest of the world? If Africa were to be wiped out completely, who will give the world resilience, the true motivation that even if, the, even if things do not work out for you, you keep trying and keep trying? I mean, think about it. Some people have seen three generations of no success but just hopes and hopes and hopes. No wonder Africans take religion to heart. It's their only hope and means sometimes. But we must realize Africa is everything to the world. Africa is everything to the world. And Africa must be everything to the world. The fourth claim, big Africa claim, is Africa is not poor. Africans are. <laughs> this we posted a few weeks ago we, receive we received interesting feedback from people. People were saying, no, 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 you can't say Africa is poor. We said, yeah, no, we're not saying Africa is poor. We're saying Africans are poor. What is poverty of a person versus poverty of a place? It's when there is poverty of the mind so that you are not thinking well for yourself. They say a fish rots from the head. How do you destroy a living organism? Destroy its thinking capacity or its capacity to maintain and sustain itself. Remove from a South African and African the ability to think for themselves. You've rendered them weak. We are not poor. We are not poor. What is poor, maybe, is our workmanship. What is poor, maybe, is our attitude. But we can learn from certain countries. Some, though they colonized us, they went ahead, though, and did the work that needs to be done. You can't say Germans only colonized us, 
Yes, they came and colonized Africa, but they went back and built the best cars that we are buying today. The Mercedes, the Audis, the BMWs, the cars that we are buying are from Germans. So Germans didn't just take over Africa or a portion of Africa. They went back and did their homework at home. You can't say America did not take over parts of certain world, parts of certain states in Africa or certain resources that they've taken. We know that they have, but they didn't just do that. Think about the black Americans who've gone back to supply the whole world with talent. The American talent is the best in the world. American singers, American actors and actresses, they are the best in the world. Why? They go back and do the work. China right now is our new colonizer economically. Do you know what they're doing? Their manufacturing is the best in the world. There is nothing China cannot replicate. <laughs> Mass production all you want, they do it in China. The war that is between China and America now is not just based on the fact that America feels that China has overtaken them now to be the world power in the world. But the other thing is that America gave China its intellectual property when it comes to business. And now China has all the originals and the fakes of anything. <laughs> can you imagine the original of an Apple iPhone and a fake of an Apple iPhone? Only China can do that. <laughs> Someone made a joke and say, maybe some of us as Africans, we must check our tags. Or maybe we are also made from China. <laughs> The fifth claim that we have is Africa has what it takes to free itself from all manner of things. What Africa has failed to do is to stop her dependence in all manner of things. I think the biggest issue for Africa and Africans is not that we do not have value and worth. We do have, but we do not place value and wealth in our value and wealth. Think about it. It is not that we are not educated but we do not place value and worth in our education. It's not that we are not innovative, it just means we don't place value and worth in our own innovation. We think once a foreigner comes, when I say foreigner, I mean from former colonizers, when someone comes from Britain and joins us, only then, then do we say, oh, now it's serious. You see with our leaders, political leaders, when they go to these conferences, when certain statesmen walk in, it's only then that things get into order. I think it's only an attitude thing. We must start waking up and realizing we are more valuable and worth, and, worth, and worth it than we think. Cry Africa, my beloved continent. It was Ali Mufukuri who said, Africa needs to have a boundless vision of a future that is fantastic to the point of being crazy, leading us to strive to be like the rest of the world, if not better. Africa has what it takes to be a great continent. All that is needed is for Africa to imagine itself as being great. We need to not limit ourselves, but to let, Af to let our, our dreams um, go big, or to let ourselves dream, dream big. Cry Africa, my beloved continent. Here is some of our propositions. I run a group called Atlas L. And what we do there is audit, tax, law, advisory, strategy, and leadership. These are some of the things we premise our work on. And I forever encourage other business people and Africans in general to think the same way or adopt our thinking. We have a great opportunity to tell our own story as Africans, we believe. We have amazing sectors and industries if we use them well. Think about it. Our government and public sector could be one of the best in the world. Our energy and natural resources could be one of the best. Our manufacturing sector could be one of the best. Think agriculture. The continent that is endowed with more land and more land to use, like Africa, has Africans who are not agricultural or agriculturalist in their thinking. Something must change there. Our financial services sector could lead the world. South Africa now has one of the best banking sector uh, regimes in the world. Our infrastructure could provide uh, a leading frontier into the world. If you look, about, if you look at our roads infrastructure, our rail, um, whether road or sea or air, Africa is endowed with the best. Even our trade as Africa, we could trade better with the 54 odd states that we have in this continent 
Nothing is stopping us from connecting and helping one another. Instead, instead of these Operation Tudula and fighting people out of our country, I think we must start realizing something must give. Because what we need, actually, is a free trade system. With a free trade system, then, it means you allow business to run its business. You allow business to run its business. I do not want someone who's going to open a door for me and say, go in because you are black. No. Yes, maybe I must be open and be given an advantage, but I must go in because I'm good and I'm, 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 I'm good at what I do. So that when I compete, I compete on merit, not just on color. I don't want someone who's going to say, occupy this land because you are black, and then I occupy it and then it, stop, it stops being productive. No, I don't want that. Because then that threatens food security. I want to be given a fair opportunity and a fair chance because as an African, I too I have potential. I want to be given a stage because I too am ready to perform on that stage. I'm ready to sing at that stage. I'm ready to act at that stage. I'm ready to run as the world is running. I'm not looking for favors as an African more than I'm looking for an opportunity and fair competition. The other element that I think we need to look at is our public-private sectors as Africa. I'm going to use South Africa as an example here. 80% of Africa, of South Africa, is managed by public sector. There's 70% under 278 municipalities, and then there's a 10% under the SOEs that you'd look at 130-odd plus um, SOEs that you have in the country. 80% of our resources and everything and services is run by public sector. Then the other 20% is split between the 15% of 2.55 million SMMEs and the 5% of the 344 odd businesses that are publicly listed on the JSE or Johannesburg Stock Exchange. So, ladies and gentlemen, this doesn't need any magic. If Africa and South Africa in particular is run by public sector and 80% is run by public sector, if public sector is inefficient, it's an indictment on us as South Africans. It means we are allowing 80% of everything of ours to be in the hands of efficient people. So public sector must wake up. But to build principles must apply again. You can't make us feel like you owe us a service when we come to ask for service. If I need a passport, I really need a passport because I must visit a family member. If I need a death certificate, I really need a death certificate because I need to bury a, a, love, a loved one. You can't treat me like you are doing me a favor. You can't have 12 counters at a service point, but only have three that are working. What are we saying there? What are we doing? 80% of everything we are is in the hand of inefficient people. Or are they inefficient? Or maybe it's a narrative. I don't know. But I do feel that sometimes people who want to retire and do nothing, they go to public sector. I'm hoping public sector changes. I'm hoping public sector is changing. Not just because the administrations are changing, but because the people who are working there have gone to school for these things that they're doing. I don't think it's the politics that run our country. It must be people who are in the ministries who went to school for those things, who understand how imperative and how, criti how critical those things are that we need service from them. Then we can speak about the 20%. We can then speak about the 15% of the 2.55 million SMMEs that are the greatest employers in this country. And then we can speak about the 5% of the 344 Johannesburg listed, Johannesburg listed companies. But also we must look at resources in that way. The public sector must realize if you are mismanaging public sector, you are actually mismanaging our potential. If you are mismanaging ESCOM, you are actually managing, mismanaging our potential. If you are mismanaging um, um, a telecom, you are mismanaging our, 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 our potential. If you are mismanaging Transnet, you are mismanaging our potential. Why? That is the public sector guarantee that we have that if we could just turn that around, we would not need the Europe to come help us. The other part as well is ours should be shared prosperity. We must start now having employees holding shares and owning equity. At least give 10% of our profits back in order to 
um, fund the delimitation of African borders agenda, particularly on issues of common interest. It's high time now that employees are given some share of ownership. It can't be right that I've got 120 employees who are just coming in as, employee, as employees, at least a portion of them, depending on how well and how good they are committed to their work and to the, call of the, and to the cause of this business, give equity there. People often fight better for what they own. If you own something, you show up better and differently than if you're just a mere employee. To improve the geopolitics, the geoeconomics, and the social economics of Africa and her people, that is what we should do. This gesture and thinking for me, I think, would show that we appreciate Africa's people towards sustaining the intelligence, the memory, and the language of peoples of Africa, and the original idea that Africans are creators and creative, but never greedy. Africans are creators and creative, but never greedy. I've worked with a lot of Africans, but I can tell you, they are not greedy. They are human, and they are humane. And I can tell you, those that come from other countries and other continents will tell you they, are, they appreciate Africa more. We must base everything we do, everything we do on humanism and not capitalism. I said we need a free trade system, yes. I'm not contradicting myself when I then say we need humanism, not capitalism. Capitalism is not sustainable, good people. Capitalism is not sustainable, good people. Humanism is sustainable. Africa must build its business around its people and the solutions, solutions it's provi it provides to its people. Because innovation suggests that it must not be the lack of something you provide that makes you rich. No, it must be the abundance of it. You must make what you provide more available so that you then make more because it's more available. It can't be threat threatening for a business to have its services more advanced and more available and in, ab in abundance. I mean, it's like ESCOM now. ESCOM turns people back and say, do not buy electricity because you don't have the greed. That's like sending away people from buying your own product. That's not wise. Humanism then says whatever products we do, we must make sure that it's available to everyone. Because in that way, then, we are advancing the cause of mankind. But also, we are saying not capitalism because we must never believe in the ideology of the minority skewed against the expenses of, of, the, of the majority. In other words, the gain of the minority must not be skewed against the gains of, of, of the majority. Especially when you look at majority being Africans, black Africans. If you're a white person and you own a business, you can't tell me that you are happy to have your gains skewed against the majority. It's not sustainable. That is why then there's more crime, that is why then there's more all these other things that are bad for the country and bad for the continent. Why? We still use capitalism when only the few control the rest of the resources. Let's change that. So that we say to people, whatever that you are doing, the ideology is, if it gains and it benefits you, it must benefit the majority, it must benefit the environment, and it must benefit Africa. At least those are the three things we must use as a test. Whatever you start, we must ask you, does it benefit majority? Does it benefit the environment? And does it benefit Africa? Those three things I'm, 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 I'm serious about. And when you look at those three things, the majority, the environment, and Africa, we are saying that every opportunity, every endeavor must look at that. Also, we are saying humanism because everything we do should borrow from the psychology of humans, particularly African intelligence. It's time we understand there is African intelligence that can help us, which is the future imagination and the reimagination. There were certain things that we were involved in inventing back in the years. When you look at those who were hunting the forests, you can't separate that from technology. That was also technology. When you look at the steel blades that were used to fight, that Ushara used at the time, Zimikonto, to make those things needed technology and the understanding of technology. So technology is not only now the gadgets that we see, technology was always the African intelligence. The ability for Africans to coexist with animals, those that were beasty and those that they could domesticate and know the difference, that needed African intelligence. The African intelligence of those that understood how to live and, lose, and use herbs to use that as part of medication. Though that is African intelligence. Let's bring it back and use that to reimagine the future and use that to imagine our present and our circumstances. The other thing is the African memory, which are records of the past. 
including our oral folklore and the empirical evidence that we were, we were here and we have our presence here. It means I must go back and remember that while my grandmother is gone with the stories she told, I must not go with those stories in my heart. Those stories may have been told as in Ganegwan, but actually I must go back now and document those. That while my mom is alive, she's not guaranteed she'll be there forever. I must record her and ask her for the wisdom and intelligence of the past and the records of the past. But also, it means that we must go back and be deliberate about moving from oral folklore. Because oral folklore means someone must pass this orally. We must move from oral folklore and sort of document our things. But also, lastly, we must not just look at African intelligence and African memory. We must also invest on African languages. African languages must now be the present expressions of the forms of creativity and numerous forms of creativity. We can't use our mother tongue only to say molo, saubona, kunjani. We must use our mother tongue to also write a thesis on geography, write a thesis on biology. It's said that it was only in 2018 or so that the first PhD on Isitswana was achieved in Northwest University. We must say that is, not an, that is not acceptable. It's unacceptable. So we must go back now and say African languages must now be prime and premium. African languages must be used by our children to express their talents then. You can't only use and express your drawings in English or use and express your, 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 arti your artistry in English. Express it in your mother tongue as well, but also then know how to transcribe it. We must go back then and fight for that. Because at the end of the day, our creativity and its tangibles must be in our mother tongues. Because then that means we have nuances in it instead of being shallow. Because the reason why we can never compete with Europe on issues of talent sometimes is that our talent is English and Englishized. So in other words, even as I speak to you here, I'm Englishizing this very talk. Take me to Europe and put someone whose mother tongue, whose mother language is English and put them here and say, say the same thing. They'll sound more convincing than I am. And I'm not saying we should not be universal, but I'm just saying we must go back now and say, even our creativity must be expressed in our mother tongues now, not to be seen as barbaric or inferior. All in all, then we are saying all our business undertakings must be as Africans to remain creators and creative while premised on the principles of sharing and shared values. Sharing meaning common interest and shared values meaning stakeholder interest. Africa, let's go to work. These are the two things I'm proposing to Africans going forward. Let's make sure that we push for research because the world is showing us that any innovation that is not backed by research is not good innovation. Any engineering or education that is not backed by research is not good, is not good engineering. Any talent or art, art, art that is not backed by research is not good art. So we must go back now and push the frontiers of, of research and research more, research more. Ask the question why? Why are we like this? Why are our things like this? Why do we think the way we do? We must go back to say why. But more than that, we must do more planning, monitoring, and evaluation. I mean, think about the scenario. Abafuetulapa outside Marisbeck discovered a stone. And for days they continued to mine, thinking what they discovered was a diamond or diamonds. What are we missing there? We are missing monitoring and evaluation. We don't have devices to monitor and evaluate. In other countries, somebody could pick the same stone and go next door and find something to test if that thing is a real stone, a real diamond or not. But for Africa and South Africa, it must go on for days with thousands of people digging and exposing them, themselves to so much only to realize it was not diamonds, it was quartz. <laughs> In other words, we must go back now and say, can we monitor and evaluate everything that we have so that we put value where value is due? Africa, umubani. We should all become the big five of Africa. I encourage you to do so. Here are the five animals we have in Africa that must teach us something now. Lions, number one, are a symbol of strength and courage and have been celebrated throughout history for these characteristics. They are also common symbols for royalty and stateliness, hence the phrase king of the jungle. As Africans, we must be like lions then. Let us value strength and courage and pride ourselves in the work we do. No inferiority, no begging, no I'm small, but yes, 
we must be strong as well and be competitive. When a Usain Bolt hits, um, or when a Usain Bolt went in and hit those tracks, he was not saying, hey, I'm someone inferior, help me please. No, it was not about that. It was about competing and doing that 100 meters in 9.4 seconds. We must compete with strength and sagacity and courage. Buffalo heads are known to stick together when attacked by predators. It is common to see the whole head return to save one of their own from the jaws of death. Like Africans, we must be like buffaloes. Let us value each other. Let me say again, let us value each other. Let us value each other and be, all, and be prepared always to defend what we stand for. In other words, if we see one of our own entrenched in the claws of death or threatened by something, let's not go there to take pictures and go viral. Let's go there to help them. When we see someone being misled or sending something or selling something that is in fake or counterproductive, let's go there and, uh, and correct. Because some of the reasons why some of us are failing is that at work we are, we are even afraid to tell someone don't do that because you think, tell on each other. Let's tell on each other. We are telling each other because we are being accountable to each other. Because I can't say I'm, going to, I'm only going to fight for you when you are threatened when I cannot correct you when you are wrong. Elephants, don't forget, as they have large brains which increase their memory capacity and aid their complex, complex patterns of communication. Like elephants, as Africans, let us value memory, the retention of information over time for the purpose of influencing our future action. Let us not forget easily so that we don't use those addictions to destroy ourselves. Use things for what they are. Leopards are skilled climbers and can carry their heavy prey up into the trees so that pesky scavengers such as hyenas don't steal their meal. Like leopards as Africans, let us value preservation, particularly of knowledge for future generations, especially African history. Despite their weight and their bulk, rhinos move fast. They can run up to 30 to 40 miles per hour. Like rhinos as Africans, let us value agility, the ability to move quickly and easily, the ability to think and draw conclusions quickly, the ability to be fast but not rushed, the ability to be quick-minded but not shallow, the ability to be responsive but not unaccountable. Let's go back now and realize, Africans, that the battle is on. Whether I'm going to continue saying, cry Africa, my beloved continent, or I'm going to say, great Africa, you've made it, it will depend on our attitude. We've started the Umubani movement, and we are now on the series on Africa. Lectures 8 to 14 are focusing on exactly that. Walk with us as we try and define our identity collectively as Africa and Africans. We hope you'll join the movement and realize what we are doing is not to turn one from another but we can work together. And maybe let me say this as part of my outro. When I keep saying black Africans, black Africans, I'm not justifying that I'm black. I'm justifying that I'm speaking from a point of what I am. I am a black man, and majority of South Africans and Africans are black. And therefore, I think it's safe that when we say so, we are talking about all of us as Africans and all our attitudes as Africans. So when I say, black Africans. I'm not excluding white Africans. I'm speaking from a point of familiarity. But when I say Africans, I'm including all of us. So even if you are white, I'm inviting you in your whiteness. Bring it. We need it. We need to work with it. Don't feel in, um, excluded, but feel included. Don't feel as if there's something sinister. We are plan planning or plotting or pushing you away. Because if Africa and South Africa reach its independence through democracy and democratic ways, it means then we must negotiate. Because there was no outright winner and outright loser. And therefore, we must go back and realize all things we must compete. And compete on a clean slate, on a balanced slate. But at the end of it all, I call on you to be truly Africans and truly contributors into this continent. Be proudly who you are in your color, in your language, in your memory, in your intelligence. Tell your st story, keep your narrative, move us forward. But more than that, join the movement, Umubani, Africa. Thank you.